Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar titled Minor Consent and Confidentiality for Adolescent Sexual Health Services in California. We hope you are all doing well and staying safe. My name is Nicole Nguyen. I am the program manager of the Family Planning Access Care and Treatment Program, or also known as the Family Pet Program at the California Prevention and Training Center. The CAPTC under contract with the California Department of Healthcare Services Office of Family Planning is sponsoring today's events. So uh, before we get started, I just want to go over some really quick housekeeping slides. So for those not familiar with GoToWebinar, so first, please make sure you check your audio and select your desired setting to join either through your computer audio or through your phone. Uh, if your internet is a little bit shaky, we highly recommend that you call in through your phone for the best possible sound. And then also, please check that you're able to see the GoToWebinar viewer screen with the slides on the left and the control panel on your right. And then there's this little orange box with a white arrow on it. So this is how you can hide or show your control panel if you don't want to see it. Or if you accidentally clicked it, this is how you can make it appear again. And then right under that is the audio tab where you can change your audio preference at any time. And then third, please submit all your comments and questions via the questions box. So today's webinar will take about 90 minutes and we'll have full time at the end for the presenter to answer all of your questions. Please send in your questions throughout the webinar and our speaker will address it as many of them as possible at the very end. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and then responses to questions not answered today live by our presenters will be sent out to participants later, along with the recording and slide deck. There is an evaluation at the end, so please fill it out because your feedback is extremely important to us and it really guides us in developing our future content. And this is also how we can track your participation for CME purposes. And then speaking of CMEs, I want to acknowledge that we're working with University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine to provide CMEs for this event. This webinar qualifies for 1.5 CME credits and is only available to those who watch the webinar live today. Those who watch the recording afterward will not be eligible for the CME credits. The link to access your CME certificate will be included in the follow-up along with the recording slides and the evaluations. All right, and then also for transparency, we want to state that all presenters, planners, or anyone in position to control the content of this CME activity have indicated that do not have any financial relationships with any commercial entities related to the content of this activity. All right, and then also lastly, before I introduce Rebecca, I just want to note that while this webinar is sponsored by the Office of Family Planning and the Family Pet Program, the information our speaker will be discussing is more focused on minor consent and confidentiality for adolescent clients accessing sexual and reproductive health care in California, and won't dive into any deep questions about family pet policies or specific program benefits like billing or coding. If you have questions regarding specific administrative policies or benefits, or wondering if your clients will qualify for the family pack services, please send us those questions in the question box and we'll get them answered in the written Q&A that will be sent out afterward. So while we won't be able to answer those questions live today, we will collect them and get the answers out to you at a later time. And so now for the exciting part, uh, I get to introduce our wonderful presenter. We're really excited to have Rebecca Goodman here today. Rebecca is an attorney and the Senior Director of Health at the National Center for Youth Law. Rebecca has advocated for young people for more than 30 years. She is a leading national expert in multiple areas, including confidentiality and information sharing across child serving system, adolescent health access, and healthcare consent. In 2016, Rebecca also launched the Reproductive Health Equity Project for Foster Youth, a really groundbreaking collaborative for public and private agencies that partner with youth to promote their healthy sexual development. She also shared her wealth and expertise on teenhealthlaw.org. It's a go-to resource of information that includes resources on confidentiality, minor consent, child abuse reporting, and health information and sharing for a variety of states and settings. And then in 2015, Rebecca also received the National Chapter Recognition Award from the Society of Adolescent Health and Medicine. And in 1997, she was named the American Bar Association Young Lawyer Child Advocate of the Year. She holds undergraduate and graduate degrees from Harvard and a law degree from the University of California at Los Angeles. And so with that, we're really, really excited. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rebecca. And then with that, the mic is yours. So Thank I will you. go ahead and share your screen. Let you share it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nicole. As we do this transfer over of screens, I just want to uh, appreciate you all for sharing um, 
a little bit of time with me today um, and we hope to make it interesting. Um, as Nicole said, I'll start with a presentation, um, but we hope to have a lot of time at the end uh, for questions and conversation. Uh, please feel free though to add your questions to the chat uh, box as we're moving on. Um, and while I may not in answer them in the moment, we will be sure to get to them at the end. Uh, okay, let me see. Now I need to just turn on my screen here. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Uh, are we, Nicole, are we seeing the screen okay? Yes, you're good. I can see um, your screen. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We we were practicing this, but I just wanted to make sure before I jumped in. Um, all right. Well, just as a quick introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with the National Center for Youth Law, we are a national legal advocacy organization with our home office in Oakland, um, but we also have offices in D.C., Phoenix, and in L.A., um, and we use a range of tools from litigation, policy advocacy, education, technical assistance, research, um, community partnership, really all with the goal to further opportunities for young people um, in many different areas, including health. Um, and you all in the uh, description for today, you uh, may have seen our learning object objectives, but that really serves as our agenda. So I'm going to start by uh, talking about some of the minor consent laws in our state, talk about confidentiality, um, and then talk about some of the best practices around implementation and finally close with um, some resources and your questions. Um, and I would not be a good lawyer if I didn't add a few caveats because that's what we always do. Um, so this information does provide information. It's not legal advice. And you will probably find me saying in some places that this is something where you really need to go to your legal counsel for specific advice on how it uh, applies in a circumstance. So just be forewarned about that. Um, this by by definition cannot be a comprehensive review of laws, but hopefully will give you a broad brush um, that helps point you to uh, questions and, and places where you can get additional information should you wish for more. Um, we've made sure that the law is accurate as of October 2023, but of course laws always do change. So if you are referring back to this at some point, please make sure you're double checking the accuracy of anything that um, is stated. Um, and I think that's it. The only other thing is a quick note on language. Um, we at the National Center for Youth Law believe all people deserve comprehensive and reproductive and sexual health education and care. And we recognize that people of many different gender identities um, and sexual orientations can get pregnant and have needs. And I will strive to use neutral language in this presentation, but there are maybe a few places where I use some genderized terms and where I do, it's because that's what we see in the law, in research or in data. Um, all right, now let's just uh, do a quick background before we jump into um, uh, specifics about the law. Um, I am gonna be talking about consent and confidentiality. They're very interrelated, um, but they are different. And it's important to keep those differences clear, especially when we're talking about the law because they refer to distinct legal concepts. So consenting for care means granting permission to a provider to engage in a health test, exam, or service. Um, a healthcare provider generally must obtain consent before providing care. So this is really oversimplified, but I like to think of consent as that opening that door into a healthcare service. It's permission to pass into that exam room. Um, federal and state laws and court decisions help establish which individuals have the legal authority to provide consent. Um, and there are times when minors can consent for themselves. And we'll be talking about that in just a minute. Um, but then a service is provided. And once it is, it's within that sort of confidentiality bubble. Um, confidentiality is what happens to the information generated within that bubble, and it tells us who's allowed to hear it um, or see that information and who has permission to make decisions about what happens to that information. 
So again, the two concepts are interrelated, but they implicate different laws. So I'm going to talk about them separately, and you'll see why it's important to make sure you uh, keep those differences separate. Um, but let's just start talking generally about why minor consent is important. Minor consent is important because confidential health services are essential in promoting teens' health. Adolescents are at a unique and vulnerable time of change and development, both physically and emotionally, um, particularly because they're beginning to establish their own identity and autonomy. And it's normal and healthy and appropriate to want to develop boundaries and independence. Um, adolescence is also a turning point. Um, decisions made by youth during this time will impact their life um, moving forward in their development. Um, and so clinical providers have the opportunity to deliver, deliver evidence-based preventive health services and education um, that's been just demonstrated to promote resiliency, to mitigate harm. Um, and why do we need minor consent? We need it to make sure do that door to care, the one we saw on the other slide, um, and thus time with clinical experts is open for all who need it. So why is confidentiality important? Because young people worry about it. Um, the first data point in the red box here is from research study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, on adolescents' reports of parental knowledge of their use of sexual health services. So 40% of female adolescents who were sitting in a, a waiting room in a family planning office were asked, they were asked, uh, would you be here if your parent had to be involved? And 40% said um, that they would not want to seek the services um, if it required parental consent. Um, the second data point is from adolescent responses to the 2013 to 2015 National Survey of Family Growth um, uh, from the Centers for De Disease Control and Prevention. Um, digging a little bit more into that JAMA study, I mentioned, um, so we had 40% of young people saying no, they would not be seeking out care um, if their parent had to be involved. Um, of those who said that they would not be seeking care, one out of five or 20% said they would use no contraception um, if they weren't able to seek it out at the family planning clinic on their own, and only 1% said they would stop having sex. So confidential access to uh, sexual health services is important. Um, but what this data also shows us is that the majority of youth do involve their parents in their healthcare decision-making. Um, and so we really want to support voluntary communication um, with parents or with adult um, supporters. Voluntary communication can be helpful in supporting adolescents' health. Um, the difference is mandated communication. Mandated communication and disclosure can be counterproductive um, unless we, uh, it's really necessary to protect the health of a young person or the public. And that's why... Um, we see a consensus among national recommending bodies that strongly supports minors' access to confidential care for sensitive services like sexual health services. Um, and in short, you know, all of us want to know that our personal health information will be kept private and young people are no different. So with all that said, it should be no surprise that in all 50 states, we have minor consent laws, laws that allow minors to consent to healthcare in certain situations. And many of these laws have been on the books for over 50 years, so it's really not anything new. Um, but each state's laws look a little different. So let's look at California's laws. Um, now, just as a general matter, a healthcare, as we said before, healthcare providers usually need consent or permission to engage in a healthcare service. And as a general rule, when people are younger than 18 years old, um, they need a parent or legal guardian to consent for that care. Um, but there are a number of exceptions to this rule. Um, so just as one example, in an emergency, when it's impossible to get a parent or guardian to consent in a timely way, um, a healthcare provider may proceed without consent. And you'll see a couple other broad categories of exceptions up on this list, the final one being minor consent laws. So let's look at those. 
Uh, in California, we have two different broad categories of minor consent laws, status laws, so basically meaning based on the minor situation in life, their status, they are able to consent to general health care. Um, and then we also have service laws, meaning that we have carved out some specific healthcare services and said that these are so important, we want to grant minors the authority to consent to the care on their own. So let's look at our status laws in California. In California, minors may consent to their own medical care if they're married or divorced, if they're in the armed forces, if they've been emancipated by a court or if they're 15 or older, living apart from their parents and managing their own financial affairs. Uh, okay, so we're gonna do a quick quiz for everyone. Uh, this is a hypothetical. So we have 17 year old Emma and she's come into a clinic with her one year old child. She wants flu shots for both of them and would like to discuss contraception. Given the status exceptions and just the status exceptions that we saw on the previous slide, would Emma be able to consent to both her flu shot and contraceptives? Um, so I think if uh, my friends can pop up the poll for us, we can, um, you all will have a chance to vote um, on either yes, no, or not enough info. Let me try that. I'm actually having a little bit difficulty. Nick, are you able to launch the poll for me? I'm just... I... I'm not sure Sorry. how to launch a poll. Is someone else able to? I actually know. Oh, there you go. Thank you. And so we'll give everyone about 60 seconds to answer that. Okay, just some last seconds. Um, and then Nick, go ahead and once you're ready, uh, go ahead and close it and share the results. Okay, thanks. We've got 53% said yes, she could consent to both flu shot and contraceptives. 29% said not enough info and 18% said no. Um, thank you so much for showing us the poll results. If we could flip back to the slides. Um, so the answer here is actually C, not enough information. So just as a reminder, Emma can consent to both the flu shot and the contraceptives, so both general medical care, if she's married or divorced, in the armed forces, emancipated by a court, or if she's 15 or older, living apart from parents and managing her own financial affairs. Um, in this case, we don't have enough information. We don't know um, if she's certain she's 17, but we don't know where she's living or if she's managing her own financial affairs. We don't know if she's been emancipated by a court. Um, it's important to note that in California, being a parent or being pregnant is not sufficient to emancipate someone, and it does not allow them to consent to their own health care in a general way. That is not true in all states, but that is our state law here in California. All right, um, so let's say she can't, we, we've decided she can't consent under a status exception. What are our state's service exceptions? Um, so here's California service exceptions, and we have included in the links in the, um, handout section, a chart, uh, a minor consent chart that includes more information about each of the minor consent laws in California. So you'll find more detail there, but you'll see here um, it includes pregnancy related care, um, outpatient mental health services, uh, substance use disorder services, intimate partner violence. Um, I just want to up, um, uplift that in, you'll see in purple some asterisks that are, those are laws that have a lower age limit. Um, young people must be 12 or older before they're able to consent to these services. And you'll see the red hashtag. Um, this is to flag that there were some laws 
passed during this 2023 legislative session that will change the, the laws that have been flagged, the outpatient mental health services and substance use disorder. Um, we will be updating our materials to reflect those changes when they go into effect in 2024, so January 1, 2024. Um, but what I want to do now is dig into the sexual health related minor consent services you see on this chart. Uh, okay, so in California, a minor 12 or older can consent to their own STD, STI related testing, treatment, and prevention. And this does include HIV. Um, and you'll see this last bullet here about prevention includes a minor's right to consent to their own, for example, vaccination for HPV um, or hepatitis B. Um, the law was written in such a way that it can cover new medical developments as we've seen as, and as we continue to see more advances in preventive um, uh, technologies. Um, and here you'll see um, that minors of any age can, in California can consent to contraception. And this applies to both prescription, like pill, patch, for example, and non-prescription methods like condoms. Um, it also applies to birth control that requires insertion. Um, now, of course, if a healthcare provider assesses a risk of any kind of coercive sex or believes that their mandated reporting duty is triggered, they will certainly make a report, but it's important to highlight that even where, for example, a mandated child abuse report is necessary, that doesn't prevent the young person from still consenting to and accessing the health care that they want and need. And we will talk about mandated reporting a little bit um, more in just a bit. Um, Pregnancy-related services, uh, California minors of any age may consent to pregnancy-related care on their own, and this includes pregnancy testing, prenatal care, postnatal care, and abortion. Um, again, like contraception, there's no minimum age defined in law, and this is both protected by statute and under our California state constitution. So let's do a couple more quizzes. So if you all can help me pop up this next quiz, I'll start reading it as you're getting it set up. 16-year-old um, Devon is sexually active. After discussions with him, the provider recommends both the HPV vaccination and um, to begin PrEP, prophylactic HIV medication to reduce Devon's risk of infection. Given the service exceptions in California, may Devon consent to the vaccination and to PrEP on his own. So our options are yes, no, yes to one, but not the other, or not enough info. And the poll has just been launched. Thank you. And I'll give everyone again another 60 seconds to answer. All right, second, I'm going to close and launch the results. All right, thank you. So we've got the majority of you said yes, but we do have a smattering um, in a number of other areas. Um, so in the answer to this one is A, Devon may consent to both. Devon is 12 or older and minors 12 or older may consent to preventive health care um, that prevents sexually transmitted infection or sexually transmitted disease. Um, PrEP is a medication designed to lower the risk of HIV AIDS infection, 
and HPV is uh, the HPV vaccine is uh, designed to prevent HPV, which is considered a sexually transmitted disease. Um, okay, let's go to our next poll. Sorry, we have a couple of them in a row for y'all. So the next poll, please. 15-year-old um, Amalia would like to discuss contraception. She's heard about implants, but wants more information. Given service exceptions in California, would Amalia be able to consent to a contraceptive implant? Poll has been launched for another 60 seconds. Okay, actually close and sharing okay. the results. Great, thank you. All right, so now the vast majority of you said yes, um, that she can consent, and that is correct. The answer here uh, is A. Um, minors of any age can consent to contraceptives, including contraceptives that require implantation. All right, we have our final poll for you now for a little bit, I promise. Um, our final question, 15-year-old Amalia, who we just saw, now she wants a pregnancy test. Um, and she already knows that if the test is positive, um, that she wants an abortion. Given the service exceptions in California, would Amalia be able to consent to both the pregnancy test and to an abortion? And our options are yes to both, no to both, yes to the test, but not the abortion no to the test, but yes to the abortion, or not enough info. We're throwing everything at you with this one. And the poll's just been launched. Okay, close the poll and sharing the results. Okay, so again, the vast majority of you said yes to both with a few saying yes to test, but no to the abortion. Um, the answer here is yes to both. Uh, minors of any age may consent to pregnancy related care, which includes pregnancy testing and minors of any age in California may consent to abortion. Um, and that is something both uh, protected via state statute and the state constitution. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize that part, the California constitution affirmatively grants um, the, uh, this right to minors. So article one, section one of the California constitution grants every Californian a fundamental right to privacy that the California Supreme Court back in 1997 determined protects the right to choose for all, including minors. Um, and in 2022, the California, California voters added Article 1, Section 1.1, which you see um, on this slide, um, and is considered a right to reproductive freedom 
to the state constitution. So both of these two fundamental rights in the state constitution stand separately from the US constitution and stand no matter what may have happened at the federal level with um, Supreme Court decisions at the federal level. So this is a right protected both by statute and um, by our state constitution here in California. Okay, so now while this uh, webinar is about sexual health services, it's really critical to acknowledge the important role that mental health and wellness plays in anyone's ability to take care of their other health needs, especially when dealing with, for example, pregnancy. Um, our Youth Advisory Board at the National Center for Youth Law lifted up to us that mental health needs can be a primary barrier to addressing sexual health so we wanted to just flag quickly that minors in California also have the right to consent to certain outpatient mental health care on their own when they're 12 or older. And even if you don't provide this service or you don't provide it in your clinic or network, um, knowing what referral sources are out there for your patients uh, can be really important. Um, so to sum up, what do, what do all these laws mean for healthcare providers? Um, it means that minors can seek these services mentioned previously on their own. Um, it means that providers do not need parent permission to provide these services. Um, and let's just look at how this might play out. We have one, I think this is the, uh, we have two more quizzes um, and they're coming up right now. Um, and so let's, let's look at how this plays out in a case scenario. So 14 year old Annalisa is in foster care. Um, their foster parent brings them to a clinic and says, I've had too many young people get pregnant while in my care. We want Annalisa to get an IUD and offers a document to the clinic that, set, that is from the court that says this foster parent has care, custody, and control of Annalisa. May the health provider proceed based on the foster parent's consent and request for an IUD. And your options are yes, no, or not enough information. And the poll has just been launched. All right, let's see what we've got. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, 56% uh, said no, 15% said yes, 29% said not enough info. Um, all right, so the answer to this um, is that the healthcare provider uh, cannot proceed. So the answer is no, the healthcare provider cannot proceed based on the foster parent's consent alone. And there's sort of two parts to this question. Um, so first, when we look at parents and guardians, um, the right of a minor to consent to care, to contraception um, or pregnancy-related care incorporates a right to refuse care. So parents cannot substitute their consent um, unless we have a situation where we're talking about an adult or a minor who is been deemed not competent and has been conserved by a court. Um, short of that happening, the minor has the right to consent or refuse care, which means um, a parent's support is great, but it, it is not legally relevant. And now the second layer here is youth and foster care. Um, youth and foster care, just like all adolescents, have the same minor consent rights as all adolescents, so they have the right to consent to or refuse contraception on their own. Um, again, as per state statute and, and the state constitution. Um, so in this case, a foster parent cannot substitute their consent um, 
uh, even if they have the right to consent to health care generally. Uh, okay, our next question, 15-year-old Chandra seeking an abortion says that she's come here from out of state. Would Chandra be able to consent to an abortion? Yes, no, not enough information. All right, let's see what we have. Um, and we have 80% saying yes, and 17% uh, 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 say not enough information, 4% no. Um, the answer here is yes. And so this was about abortion, but it could have been about any minor consent um, service in the state. Um, and really the, the simple rule is that while you're in California, California laws apply. Um, so even if this is a young person whose state of residence is Nevada or Oregon or New York, um, when they come to California, um, California minor consent laws are what are applicable. So if they have the right to consent in, to abortion in California, they have, um, Chandra has the right to consent uh, here while in our state. Uh, okay. I am now going to shift to talk about confidentiality. If you have any questions about any of the consent uh, material that we just went through or things that I didn't address, please don't hesitate to include it in the questions and we'll try to get to that um, when we get to the end. Um, but now let's start in on confidentiality. Um, when we talk about confidentiality, there are rules at both the federal and state level. Um, at the federal level, everyone's heard of HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Um, and what it really does is set a baseline across the country. But what HIPAA says that if there is any state law that offers more confidentiality protection to a patient, then we should defer to that state law. And California is one of the states that has a significant body of legislation that protects um, health information and in some and in several places sets a higher bar than does HIPAA. And I mention that because it's important to know that what we do in California and what we need to abide by in California may not always look like what our colleagues do in other states. Um, so people may use coll colloquially the term HIPAA, it's because of HIPAA, but it's important to know that when we're talking in California, really what we mean is it's because of HIPAA and our state law. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that in addition to these, there may be some specific laws at the federal or state level that apply because of the type of healthcare you're providing or the funding stream. Um, and those may set their own and sometimes higher confidentiality rules um, and may be really what you need to defer to. And a prime example are um, rules, federal regulations that apply for any services funded through the Title X Family Planning Program. Um, these may apply in lieu of HIPAA or state law if they are more protective. So it's really important to speak with your own legal counsel about what laws apply in your setting, given the type of services you apply, provide, and the funding streams. Um, but that said, moving forward, I'm going to talk about HIPAA and the California Medical uh, Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, because those are the two rules that apply to most folks in this state. Um, so when we look at HIPAA and the Com California Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, the general rule is that healthcare providers must protect the confidentiality of personal health information 
And as a general matter, in order to release that information, the provider needs a signed authorization. And we use the term authorization just to keep it really separate from consent to care, because sometimes it may be a different person who's consenting to care than, than the person who is signing an authorization. Uh, now that said, there are exceptions in confidentiality law that can sometimes allow or require disclosure of information even without that signed uh, authorization. And child abuse reporting is one example. We'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, but first, let's just look at sort of the general rule and that uh, release, um, that signature. Um, when minors receive services that they consented to or could have consented to under state or other law, then the minor must sign that authorization form. Um, so when we're providing minor consent sexual health services and you need a release, the minor patient signs that release. Now, one of the big questions is, can parents be informed of minor consent sexual health services? And the answer is not without a signed authorization from the minors, provider uh, from the minor patient. Providers must keep minor consent services confidential um, from parents unless otherwise instructed by the minor. Um, there are a few minor consent um, statutes that have different rules, um, and you can find those in that grid that we have linked in the handouts. Um, now, as I said, there are exceptions that allow providers to share information um, or require them to even without a release. And here's just a few examples, but there are many others. So it's important to work with your own legal counsel to understand when, when those other exceptions might arise and to really be clear on when it's a discretionary exception or when it's mandatory. And when I say discretionary, my, an example would be um, care coordination. Both HIPAA and California law um, allow healthcare providers to share information with other healthcare providers in order to coordinate care, provide treatment, um, but it doesn't require providers to do so. And that means you as a practitioner or your clinic may choose to adopt policies and practices that support care coordination across from provider to provider, or you may choose to adopt a policy or practice that says we aren't going to do that without getting our patients signed consent because of the type of services we provide or the relationship we have with our um, patients. Um, but when it's a mandatory um, disclosure under state law, then there is no such discretion. And child abuse reporting and, and mandatory public health reporting are two examples where if once that uh, disclosure obligation is triggered, you must report, you have no discretion. Um, so let's let's just take a second to look at child abuse um, reporting. Um, there are some activities that healthcare providers are mandated to report. Um, it's not, you know, there's public health mandated reporting. There are other mandated reporting laws. Uh, right now, I'm going to be talking about um, child abuse reporting under the California Child Abuse and Neglect Reporting Act. In general, mandated reporters must report if they have a reasonable suspicion that a minor has been subject to neglect or abuse as those terms are defined within that Child Abuse and Neglect Reporting Act. Um, hurting oneself or hurting others is not actually uh, mandated to report under the Child Abuse Reporting Law, but there may be ethical duties that require such reports. And for example, as discussed in the Tarasoff case, sometimes these are called the Tarasoff reporting duties. Um, and so it, this is not to say that those aren't reportable, but I'm gonna be focusing on child abuse reporting. Um, within the definition of child abuse um, in our state law, there are several categories. Um, and we've included in the handouts a document that provides a lot more information about each of those categories and their definitions. The document is a little bit out of date. The material is still relevant, um, but I would encourage you to um, just check on anything if you're looking to rely on it before, uh, check to see if it needs updating before relying on it. 
Um, and I, we don't have time to go through all of those categories, so I want to just look at um, the definition of what is considered reportable sexual abuse. California defines reportable sexual abuse by reference to criminal statutes in the penal code. Um, and that is not always super helpful for practitioners who have to try to understand what's reportable. Um, but when we look at all those penal codes, it's, a, it's possible to break them down and, and really put them into three broad categories. So the first is what I'm calling sexual assault. It's really any non-consensual or coerced sexual activity, um, anything like incest or molestation, all of that would be non-consensual activity that would be reportable under that broad category of sexual assault. Sexual exploitation includes trafficking. It can include pornographic endeavors. Um, again, the linked material in the handout provides a lot more specific details about what would be included in each of those categories. And then the third category, there are a small set of situations in which um, disparate age sexual activity is reportable based on the age of uh, the two people involved alone, um, separate and apart from whether it's considered consensual or voluntary or in trafficking. Um, in general, if mandated reporters, a mandated reporter must report if they find out a minor has engaged in any of these listed activities or they have a reasonable suspicion that they have. Um, now, I know there's often a lot of questions about that third category. Um, again, you'll find more details in the handout about when different sexual activity may be reportable based on age alone, but we'll uh, on the following slide, I'm going to share a graph that just talks about when uh, sexual intercourse may be reportable based on age alone. Um, so now on, in this chart, you'll see some boxes in, in orange with an M in them. Um, that indicates that based on age alone, the sexual intercourse would be reportable. So age of patient is 12, age of partner is 14, 15, 16, et cetera, that would be reportable based on age alone. You'll notice there's a number of boxes that are in white and have the letter CJ. CJ stands for clinical judgment. Um, we use that because we want to emphasize that even if this is a situation where sexual intercourse is not reportable based on age alone, so for example, a 16-year-old having sex with another 16-year-old is in that box with a CJ. Um, the fact that it's in white doesn't mean you never report it. it. You still need to consider whether this is coerced activity, whether it in, in, involves sexual assault, whether it involved trafficking and do that kind of analysis. And you would still report if you had concerns that it fell into one of those other categories. It just wouldn't be reportable based on age alone. Um, so a couple questions that sometimes come up around abuse reporting. Um, do I need to report all illegal activities? No, just because something's illegal does not automatically mean a police report or a CPS report should be filed. Um, so remember, we still are under this broad mantle of confidentiality. There's an exception that requires disclosure that opens up those records when, uh, when, for example, there may be a reasonable suspicion of child abuse, but unless uh, an illegal activity falls within that definition of child abuse, it wouldn't be reported. And an example might be you hear about a young person who shares that they drank alcohol um, or maybe even used some um, illicit drugs. Um, those are certainly illegal for a minor, but it isn't something that would be automatically reportable as child abuse. Um, do I need to inform parents if I make a report? Um, so again, confidentiality law, it, this is still under the mantle of confidentiality. Um, confidentiality includes an exception that allows you or requires you to share information with Child Protective Services or law enforcement in order to make a report, but it doesn't mean the information being disclosed is suddenly free of any confidentiality protection and open to anyone else. So if parents would generally not have a right to that information, for example, um, because it was disclosed during delivery of contraceptive services, 
um, it, it just because a child abuse report is being made doesn't suddenly mean that you can let parents know. So it may mean that you need to get the minor's consent before you can disclose to parents that a child abuse report has been made. Um, if someone is from another county or state, do I report locally? Um, so this comes up all the time. Sometimes you may see a patient who comes from another county or another state or even another country, and people ask what reporting laws they should follow. Um, you follow the laws of California, the state that you're in. Um, so you follow what the definitions of reportable abuse are in our state, and you report pursuant to the California Child Abuse and Neglect Reporting Act. When it comes to where you make that report, you can make that report to your local CPS. Um, it, even if that person is not from the state, um, CPS then has the duty to investigate whether there needs to be a cross report made to a third agency that has jurisdiction. Um, but that is not, there is not an obligation on you to track down the appropriate jurisdiction for making a report for someone who comes from uh, another place. Okay, so uh, that's the end of confidentiality. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the um, into the question section of the control panel. Um, but for now, I'm going to move on to practice. Um, because oftentimes I do these trainings and I say, here's the law, it's black and white, but I know it's really easy for me to say, here's the law. Um, and the really hard thing is on you all. How do we implement this? And how do we do this in a way that makes our practice feel more adolescent friendly and um, supportive of the adults who are supporting young people? Um, often adolescents are a small percentage of patients you may be seen um, and your program and practice may be shaped by the needs of adult clients. Um, but it's important to acknowledge that adolescents do have unique needs um, and it can be even more critical to think about those needs um, and think about the needs of um, your clients who may be part of current or historically marginalized populations who tend to face additional barriers to care. Um, so as I think was mentioned at the top, my office coordinates a collaborative of agencies that work to address the reproductive health needs and disparate incomes, frank, outcomes, frankly, of youth in foster care. Um, youth in foster care are far more likely to identify as youth of color, far more likely to identify as LGBTQ, far more likely to be low income and to have experienced trauma. And so we ask them um, for their advice about sort of what, what we need to do to make programs and services more adolescent friendly and about their own experiences. And so just as an example of some of what we've heard um, these are some quotes from some of our youth advisors um, sharing about some of their experiences. In general, they lifted up both systems issues as well as individual practice issues when they've sought um, sexual health services. Um, so, you know, just as an example, a lot of times my doctor will say I need to do something, but then doesn't offer me any support in figuring out how to get that thing done. We heard that a lot around transportation or sort of coordinating with a pharmacy. Um, there's been many times where I felt my doctor had certain stereotypes about me. Um, I called for an appointment, but I didn't have a phone number um, they could call back on. So I just kind of dropped it and didn't go in for care. Um, personally, I didn't have a regular clinic. I moved around too many times, over 16 different locations just in high school. So each time I moved, it was a different clinic. Uh, the World Health Organization has developed quality standards for how to improve the adolescent friendliness of healthcare service delivery. Um, so you'll see them here, these broad categories, um, accessible, acceptable, equitable, appropriate, and effective. Um, our team worked in our collaborative, um, worked with these um, and worked with a team of youth and health providers to develop some tools and assessments and um, policy rec and practice recommendations to try to help make sexual and reproductive health services more welcoming. Um, and so that's what I'd like to share a little bit with you now. These are not my, I'm a lawyer, these are not my advice. This is advice coming from young people and health care providers working together. 
um, and I'll just flag, we've collected them in something we're calling the Foster Friendly Healthcare Toolkit. Um, I'll show a link to that at the end, um, but the, the content I'm about to share, if you want to look at it in more depth, you can find in the toolkit. Um, so the toolkit really is um, based in three guiding principles. We took the WHO principles and the youth and provider feedback and distilled them into these three. Um, the first is um, to engage in shared decision-making with youth. Um, this means that the care should be client-centered, strengths-based, and culturally humble. Um, it looks like collaborating with youth to incorporate healthy choices and healthy behavior, um, providing options, supporting autonomy and agency, um, and assuring that young people have the time, space, and support to choose what's right for them. And I think this quote is great because while as clinicians, you bring so much expertise um, to the engagement, um, young people are the experts in their own lives um, and are really the only ones that can tell you why certain things may work or may not work for them. Uh, the second guiding principle is to respect and accommodate individual needs and preferences. Um, take the time to get to know youth and their priorities as individuals. Um, and remember that most important, the most important concern to address first is the concern that brings the patient to the room, even if you as a provider um, feel compelled to address many other um, issues. And oops. Um, and uh, we think this, this quote sort of encapsula encapsulates this. People are really looking to create that connection with you and they will be more open and forthcoming if you are able to approach them in a way that feels like you recognize them as humans is what they've told us. Um, and our final one is to center the impact of response to and recovery from trauma. A lot of times we hear about trauma-informed care. Sometimes people talk about trauma-responsive and healing-centered approaches. Um, this is certainly important when you're dealing with groups like youth and foster care who've by almost by definition all been through trauma, but too many of us have been through trauma. So adopting these practices across your um, uh, clinic can be really powerful. Um, and a lot of this has to do with um, providing agency and an autonomy um, and also being very confidential, confidentiality conscious. Um, so let me use a case example to just sort of highlight how this might happen in practice. So V is 16 years old, non-binary, and currently living in a short-term residential therapeutic placement. This is what we call group homes now. Um, their legal name is Victoria, but their chosen name is V. V, v arrives at the health center um, in a group home van, and when it's time for the appointment, V is brought to the exam room on their own. What should be the provider's first step? So I just want you to take a second to think about how your, your ideas on how you would approach this person. I'm not going to ask folks to sort of volunteer anything, but just think about what you see here. Um, and if we think about sort of those grounding principles we were just talking about, um, one of the ones that jumps out for me is respecting and accommodating individual needs and preferences. Uh, you will do a lot by uh, recognizing up front when you go in the room um, that V identifies as non-binary and simple things like asking about pronouns and preferred names, making sure you use gender neutral questions um, can help send that signal that you are recognizing their individual needs. Um, if we think about the third prong uh, about trauma, you know, this person's coming in from a group home that it's important to recognize that there may be trauma in their lives. And so some of your first steps may be to want to establish safety and parameters for confidentiality. Um, I'll note that the toolkit I mentioned has tools that go into more depth about all of the things I've just mentioned about how to explain confidentiality, um, a tool for engaging in a trauma-informed introduction, and how to even physically set up rooms in a trauma-informed way. Um, just as an example of one of the 
toolkit tools that we have. Um, this is this is one of the tools in the toolkit. It's a trauma sensitive approach to a physical exam, and it talks about sort of um, it gives some sample language here. So uh, before we get started, I'm going to walk you through what we'll be doing during the exam, um, how to talk through an exam, and then what to say after. Um, the ways to ask questions, um, and it has hyperlinks to additional materials. Uh, there's also uh, tools for how to explain confidentiality in plain language and, and sort of uh, adapt what you're saying to the audience, depending on their age and their uh, what they're there for. Um, if we go back to V, um, let's say v, you've done a great job introducing yourself and V's decided your energy is good and that they want to open up and they tell you they've been dating someone and would like to go on birth control. Um, how do you approach this? So again, just think about it for a second. And if you think about sort of the principles that we were laying out there um, around shared decision-making, centering the impact and response to trauma and respecting and accommodating individual needs. Um, I'll let you just uh, think about it a little bit. Um, I will, uh, what I will flag is that we have in the toolkit both um, some tools that might be helpful for this, um, uh, tools on how to do shared decision-making approach to contraceptive counseling, um, and uh, even tools on how to do inclusive counseling with folks um, across the gender spectrum. Um, because of course, um, not it's not just cisgender heterosexual females that can get pregnant. Anyone with a uterus and ovaries can, even if they're taking testosterone. Um, and uh, so there's more details on sort of how to um, both do counseling with, uh, across the gender spectrum and to do so in an inclusive way. And it's also, there's a lot of tools in there that talk about shared decision-making and understanding um, how a young person can be an expert in their own uh, lives. Um, uh, so V shares with you that they're worried that their group home supervisor may be confiscating their birth control. And they also mentioned that they can, um, they're not sure they'll be able to come back for another appointment since they have limited access to transportation. Um, so this case highlights why it's so important to know the rights of young people, whether they're in foster care or in the general community, um, so that you, uh, that you sort of have flags go up if you hear about things that don't sound right. Um, just as an aside, group homes are not allowed to confiscate contraception, so that would be illegal, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Um, and that's important to take into account when you are coming up in a, using shared decision making with a contraception plan for somebody like V. So is there contraception that may be appropriate given the living circumstances and the realities that V is living in right now? Um, some of the other things you'll find in the toolkit, these are just a couple examples of other uh, tools that you'll see there. Um, so encourage you to take a look and you'll see a lot more youth quotes and voice there. Um, if you're interested in the toolkit, there's a link here. Um, a lot of the other charts and guides I've mentioned today can be found on our website, teenhealthlaw.org. And I would encourage you to go back to that in January because as I said, some laws are updating at that point. So we'll have updated material online. Um, and I think that brings us to questions. So we welcome questions in the question section of the control panel. Um, and or if you later on think of things, I don't hesitate to reach out to me. I put my email on this um, slide. We will be updating, in addition to sort of answering questions here, we'll be updating some materials um, for our website. So if there are a lot of um, frequently asked questions here that resonate, um, we will try to make sure that we create material to be responsive to your needs. Um, and I think that is it. Yay, thank you so much. That was wonderful. So. 
Rebecca, I think you, if you want to, you can start with the Q&A. We do have a lot of good questions. And I just want to remind everyone, I know if you're familiar with our webinar, you know that we uh, usually end at 1.30 sharp. So if you have to leave, don't worry about it. But Rebecca has also kindly agreed to stay on for an extra 15 minutes to answer any questions. Since we get a lot of questions coming in, we have a really robust audience. So if you need to leave, go ahead and still put in your questions. We'll get them answered and get it to, out to you uh, in a few weeks. So take it away, Rebecca. Okay, so I'm just going to start to go through the questions I see here. I see a question, does prevention include consenting to HPV vaccines? And the answer is yes. Minors 12 and older may consent to uh, preventive STI services, and that does include um, consenting to the HPV vaccine. Um, uh, Okay, let's see. If a teenager presents for a visit in the clinic, is it enough to get consent over the phone from the guardian or do the guardians have to be physically present? Uh, okay, so as we said, as a general rule, a parent or guardian usually needs to consent to healthcare. So I'm assuming in this case, we're not talking about minor consent services. Um, we're talking about, let's say a, a physical exam. Um, there's nothing in black and white law that explicitly requires a parent to be physically in front of you when they consent to services or to sign a written document. Um, that said, for risk management purposes, your lawyer or your organization may choose to adopt a practice that requires physical presence or requires a signature um, and it, it sort of depends on where you work and the kinds of services that you provide. Um, so the answer to that question is the law itself may not explicitly require it, but you, your practice may choose to adopt that in order to make sure that you can assure that this is in fact the parent that's calling. Um, or if, for example, you're trying to get a consent that will be an ongoing consent in order to just sort of document it for your records. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, what protections or guidelines are there for providers who use minor reported status exceptions like living separate from family and that ends up not being true? Uh, okay, so this is, this is one of those things where it's important to work with your legal counsel on sort of the best approach because the law doesn't explicitly require you to get sort of a notarized document from the young person um, you know, swearing on their mother's grave or whatever that they are um, in fact living apart from their parents, that they're 15 or older, but your, your counsel and your administrative team may choose to adopt um, different policies and practices in order to uh, 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 be able to sort of show that you've at least taken a look. So as a practical matter, if someone's been emancipated by a court, they would have a court order. They might have a, an ID from the DMV that says that they're an emancipated minor. There's different ways to um, confirm that they in fact fit that criteria. Um, some people have created their own forms that, with check boxes that they'll ask a minor to fill out to confirm whether they're living apart um, and uh, financially independent. But again, that's really something to work with legal counsel on to decide sort of uh, how frequently you see young people that may might fit that category and what would what would be sort of appropriate that wouldn't ultimately become uh, a barrier to care for young people who legitimately fit into that criteria. Uh, okay. Um, is a parenting minor able to consent for care for their own child, even if they cannot consent to all care for themselves? Um, yeah, thank you for asking that. So a parent is able to consent to health care for their own child, even if the parent is a minor. So uh, going back to, I think, that original quiz question, if we've got a parent coming in with their one-year-old child and asking for flu shots, um, the minor parent may not be able to consent for their own flu shot, but they would be able to consent for their child's flu shot. Um, they would be able to consent to brain surgery for their child, but the parent may not be able to consent for their own brain surgery. They would need their own 
guardian or parent's consent. Um, it's sort of an interesting, um, interesting sort of dichotomy we've set up. Contraception services, what about permanent methods of contraception? Thank you for asking about that. Minors are not able to consent to sterilization. I should have, I should have made that clear on the slide. So minors can consent to long-acting contraception, but they cannot consent to sterilization as a minor. Uh, contraceptive services is for all minors less than 12 included. Yes, contrac minors of any age, including minors under age 12, can consent to contraception, just as minors of any age may consent to pregnancy-related care. And sometimes that throws folks, but really what, uh, what they've wanted to acknowledge is that everybody goes through puberty at different ages and stages. And if we have a young person who's 10 or 11 who has questions, who thinks they might need contraception, who thinks they might need a pregnancy test, we want to make sure that every door to care is open so that they can come in and see you. Um, maybe this is about education, um, sexual health education. Maybe this is someone who is in a dangerous relationship. Um, but we want to make sure both that their immediate health care needs are met and that um, we have eyes of trained experts on them to make sure that we know what's going on and that they're taken care of. Uh, if the 17, uh, going back to that original case, if the 17 year old wants only contraception and not the flu shot, then she will be able to receive contraception services. Correct. So the 17 year old parent may not have been able to consent to her flu shot, but because we have a service exception that allows minors to consent to contraception, she would be able to get the contraception on her own. She just wasn't able to get both services in that case scenario. Uh, does consent for contraception also include assurance that info will not be shared with parents um, or is it parents a separate set of laws? Yeah, so as they are separate laws, but as we saw, the law in California is that if the minor consented or could have consented to the care, so the minor consented to contraception or could have, they can, um, then the minor controls release of that information and it cannot be shared with parents without getting explicit written consent from the minor patient. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, okay, I see a couple folks flagging where they believe there may have been in practice some violations of these um, laws. That's not something I can comment on sort of in a general webinar, but it's but to the extent that you have questions or concerns about that, um, that's something to uh, flag to your own legal counsel or maybe reach out separately and I can talk to you about it in more uh, detail offline. Um, can mental health care include medication? Um, so minors 12 or older in California who are considered um, uh, mature enough to participate intelligently in services may consent to outpatient um, mental health therapy on their own. This does not include the right to consent to psychotropic medication. So if a minor needs medication, to, um, psychotropic medication, they would still need to get their parent or legal guardian's consent. Is a foster parent even the legal guardian for a minor? Wouldn't it be their caseworker? That's a great question. Um, in some cases, the person with legal custody with cons healthcare consent rights may still be their own biological parent. In some cases, it may be the foster parent. And so it depends on the status of the case. It can be really confusing. Um, we actually have some materials up on teenhealthlaw.org that helps explain who's able to consent for general health care for uh, kids in the foster care system, depending on sort of the stage of their case and the type of care that they need. Is it an emergency situation? Is it minor consent? Um, so if you work with a lot of uh, youth in foster care, I encourage you to, to take a look on our website. Uh, could you pull up the minor consent exceptions based on status slide one more time, please? Um, absolutely, and I also will say that they are included in the handout that's called the minor consent grid on the final page. You'll find them 
of uh, the final page of that grid. Um, but let me see if I can both share my screen and um, I will go back to the beginning. Sorry for closure eyes <laughs> for a second this, as I screen back through these. Uh, okay, I'm getting there. All right, there's our uh, status exceptions. Um, all right, there is a question about patients with intellectual disabilities um, or that are non-communicative and parents making medical decisions. Um, and they usually don't have legal documentation as providers just follow the parent's lead. Um, yeah, this is really common. It's really tricky. It can be confusing for the parents because they're so used to making decisions. And it may be obvious that their child, even if the child is now 18, 19, 20 years old, um, doesn't have the capacity to consent to health care. Um, but if this is um, a young person who is... Uh, uh, whether they're a young adult or a minor who is really going to need assistance moving forward, then the parent should be encouraged to establish a conservatorship to get um, legal documentation that gives them the legal authority to continue to make healthcare decisions on behalf of their child. Um, and there are legal service organizations that can help them with that and that have a lot more information available. Um, uh, like disability rights that have a lot more information available on sort of what that process might be. Um, do we need to look at both the status and service coverage in order for the minor to provide consent? You know, that's a great question. It really depends on the kinds of uh, services that you provide and the kinds of clients that you have coming in. If you have a lot of young people coming in, a lot of minors coming in for general Healthcare, it may behoove you to have some materials that help explain the status exceptions and that allow minors to, like we were saying before, do a check boxes to identify whether they meet one of these categories. If what you primarily provide is family planning, it may be less relevant because most of the services you provide may fall under the service exceptions. Um, and so it would be less necessary. Oops, where did our service exceptions go? Um, so if you really focus on contraception, family planning, STI services, it may be that you, um, you know, you pretty much know that you're covered here, but it can be helpful to at least know that there are uh, exceptions in both categories. Uh, for IUD consent, do we need to collect consent from both foster care and minor patient? No. So minors, whether they're in foster care, juvenile justice, um, any even immigration, they have the right and they have the exclusive right to decide whether or not to um, have contraception, including IUDs. So if a minor in foster care um, wants an IUD, their consent alone is sufficient. Um, and if they say no, that is sufficient. It can't be overridden by um, the foster care system or the foster parent. Um, let's see if this. Uh, if the sexual health related request pr uh, primary indication is other than contraception, such as to mitigate a current medical condition risk, does the minor consent apply? Um, all right, so I think sometimes this comes up when people may be asking for birth control to help, uh, you know, with skin conditions is just one example. This is really a question you should bring to your own legal counsel. I know that sometimes young people may claim that they're looking for example to for contraception in order to address um, a skin condition when in fact their real interest is contraception for contraceptive sake um, so it's not as I don't think there's really a black and white answer that I can provide to that but I, I do think it's an important question to bring to your own legal counsel to sort of just um, create 
discussion around uh, what the scope of minor consent might be in those situations. Um, okay, I see there's, can you explain more about foster parent consent for contraception? I'm not sure what more to say. I can say that we have a lot more information about um, both uh, rights and obligations of the foster care agency and the rights of youth on a separate website that's called fosterreprohealth.org. Um, and we also have it in our um, toolkit, which I shared the link to. Um, and if you look, if you still have questions or if you serve a lot of youth in foster care and want to talk to us about some of the specifics, um, I encourage you to reach out um, via my um, uh, uh, email address that I shared. I'm going to see if I can get back to the resource link page. Um, so the toolkit that you see linked here includes more information on delivering services, including sort of legal issues, delivering services to youth in foster care. I heard consent laws also change for substance use disorder and treatment. I'm curious what that change is. Indeed, so the law, um, uh, a law was passed in 2023 that creates space for young people to consent to certain um, substance use medications, um, disorder treatment medications. Um, and we will, and it uh, that law goes into effect January 1st. Um, and we will be putting, um, updating the chart that, um, on teenhealthlaw.org at that time to reflect the law. But it was trying to create space for um, young people to be able to access, uh, a, a small group of young people to be able to access some specific medication as part of substance use um, disorder treatment. Uh, does it relate to MAT and consent needed for this? Um, uh, it relates to, and I always say the wrong name wrong, by proof, I, yeah, I, I won't even pretend to say it. So the, it does relate to MAP, but to a specific, um, specific medication. Um, all right, question on consent. Uh, consent allows treatment providers to provide services to minors without parent consent. Um, what if a case coordination provider wants to help the minor coordinate their reproductive health care. Would the care coordination provider be protected under? Hmm, I'm not sure I understand. I'm afraid, um, Jeremy, I'm not sure I fully understand that question that you are asking. I apologize. Um, please feel free to add more detail or, uh, or reach out to me privately. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, we are having a... Uh, we are having a hard time with our EHR um, and getting appropriate documentation done for sexual health things with patients who are minors. Uh, any insights on that or what our other clinics have done to make sure minor sexual health info is kept separate from general charting. Um, unfortunately, this has been an issue from the moment we started electronic health records. Um, part of the challenge is that some of the big companies that, um, that sort of do the software for electronic health records, they sell their services nationally. Of course, each state has its own minor consent laws. Um, so while they recognize that those exist um, and the confidentiality rules are different across all those states as well, um, it's not been easy to sort of create space that recognizes exactly the way that we do it in California. Um, I, I personally find it really frustrating. I know that there are a number of groups nationally looking at this. Um, even as we've now gone into the 21st Century Cures Act and really look now we're looking at concerns about electronic health records, not only having information shared with parents, but crossing state lines. Um, there are folks looking at that. Um, I think the only thing I can say is that this has been a long time 
problem um, and um, you aren't alone. Um, although to the extent that there's anyone on the webinar who has any successes they might want to share, I would encourage you to include that in the chat right now. Um, could parents call in to schedule an appointment for their minor through our call center? Um, I appreciate that question because a lot of times we're talking about minor consent laws and really emphasizing that information can't be shared with parents without minors um, permission, but that doesn't mean we don't want parents involved. We do know that the majority of young people want to include their parent, guardian, or that supportive adult in their life. Um, and that's wonderful to support them in that. And so the, the big question would be just making sure that your client is comfortable with their parent being involved and helping them um, and that you're able to uh, confirm that carefully and clearly with your client so that they're not feeling pressured to sign a release, for example. Um, now, you know, if a parent is making a, a, sometimes you may not know if it's a parent or someone else making an appointment um, for a minor. Um, and so that also leads to sort of thinking about when, when we're in that clinical space, sort of how do we make sure that this is something that the young person actually wants. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, are insurance companies required to follow HIPAA policies when it comes to sending the bill to a minor's residence where parents also live? So this is a, an important question. California um, is one of a few states that has changed um, some of the rules for insurance. Um, so in our state, if anyone um, gets a sensitive service and that in, and sensitive service includes any sexual uh, or reproductive health service, um, insurance companies are supposed to send any communications about that care to the patient, not to the owner of the policy. Now, as a practical matter, um, they may be sending that letter uh, or communication to in the name of a patient, but at the home that they share with a parent. So that may not be as protective as we wish. Um, but minors are allowed to reach out to their insurance company and request what's called a confidential communication request and tell the insurance company, I want my communications about my sensitive health care to be sent to an alternative address or an alternative email. And maybe that's their friend's house. Maybe that's their provider's address. Um, but the insurance company is required to um, accept that request and to start diverting communications to the address that the minor patient shares. Um, there have been some challenges implementing this and, and getting insurance companies to actually honor this law, um, but, it's, but you do have the right to call into your insurance company and confirm that they've got an alternative address on file before you um, seek a service. So if a young person wants to um, seek a prophylactic HIV medication or wants an abortion or wants a pregnancy test and, and, you, and wants to use their insurance and make sure their parents don't find out, they can try to put these um, confidential communication requests in place before confirm it's in place um, and then uh, b before they go and seek the service and have information go out. But I, but again, you know, in practice, I think that there have been some breaches, um, but it is important to know, that, at least on paper, the law says that there is a, a way to divert that communication. Um, okay, there was a similar question around insurance. Um, uh, Uh, 18 year old is pregnant and partner is 35. Should this be reported? Um, child abuse reporting is about young people um, who are not adults, about minors, people who are under 17. Um, if this is someone who um, became pregnant when they were 17, you may want to take a look at the chart and look at the definitions of child abuse and decide whether you think that this is something that would be reportable um, as someone who was 17 
engaging in sexual activity? Um, you know, was this a coerced relationship? Um, but that I would look to the guide that we, the more detailed guide that we have in the handouts. Uh, All right, there's quite, what if an incident was already reported, for example, sexual assault, do we need to continue reporting if patient continues to disclose when asked the questions? Um, this is an important question to bring back to your own clinic and legal counsel um, for guidance. Um, the only thing that I can say is that mandated reporting is an individual duty, um, but it is, um, appropriate and allowed for clinics and agencies to come up with some standardized reporting uh, protocols. Um, so that's why it can be helpful to work with your clinic on sort of how to approach that. And depending on the kinds of service that you provide, it may be that you're in a, in a situation where that would come up a lot. Um, and so it can be really helpful to talk that through. Uh, most sexual assault will be reported by the provider, correct? Um, so again, mandated reporting is um, an individual duty. So if you as a provider um, have a reasonable suspicion of child abuse, that means that your duty to make a report has now been triggered. That said, if you work within a system, the law allows your system to create procedures that centralize reporting. So it may be that you're in a place where they've, they've asked providers to um, centralize all reports through one staff person. That's okay. Um, it's just on you to make sure that, that, that the person who sort of is tasked with that duty actually does make that report if you think that um, a report is necessary. Do all these consent and confidentiality laws still operate under FERPA in a school setting? Um, great question. We have a number of materials that talk about HIPAA and FERPA and the differences in confidentiality rules when you provide services on a school site. Um, consent laws operate the same no matter where you are, whether you're on a school site or in a private or public um, uh, clinical setting, um, but confidentiality laws may be different um, depending on um, you know who is employing the healthcare provider, the scope of services being provided, the funding stores, et cetera. So um, if you work in a school setting, we encourage you to take a look at the HIPAA or FERPA materials we have up on the Teen Health Law website. Um, Let's see. I see we're sort of up on time. I can stay a few minutes over, but I don't know. I know you wanted to make sure people did evaluations. Is there anything you need to share, Nicole? Um, no, I think that is good. So if you are able to if stay as long as you can, Rebecca answers me because you want to. And once you, we ends, then the um, the evaluation will go out and then we'll collect all unanswered questions. Okay, great. Uh, okay, I can stay a few minutes more. Um, comment on reporting. Even if we as providers do not inform parents after a report has been made regarding confidential information, we have no control over whether or not law enforcement will divulge information from the report to parents. That's absolutely true. And in fact, we think it's part of trauma-informed mandated reporting is to help your client understand that, that while you may not be sharing information with their parents, if CPS or law enforcement chooses to go out and investigate, they are not under the same rules and they may well let your parents know. And so um, you may want to talk about sort of what does that mean? Is there any danger when parents find out? Is there a a better way to let parents know, but I appreciate you um, sharing that comment because that's I should have said that. Um, in the nickel handout, the table addressing when sexual intercourse with a minor must be reported, there's an asterisk at the bottom that states this is about vaginal intercourse. I was wondering why the table and information doesn't apply to other types of sex. Great question. 
Um, the, the answer is that there's slightly different rules um, depending on the kind of sexual engagement, if it's touching, if it's, um, uh, uh, for example, and um, the, the longer handout that we shared includes more details, but we actually will be updated because that has been asked so much, we will be updating that grid um, to include um, other types of intercourse, specifically um, uh, anal intercourse and, um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking, um, to a couple other types of intercourse uh, in order to try to be more comprehensive um, because that question has come up a lot. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, and then someone asked for the toolkit link, so thank you, it's right here. Um, all right, I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna try to find one more before I need to close out. Um, uh, why does California put a lower age limit on STI services but not birth control services? So minors need to be 12 or older to consent to STI services but minors of any age can consent to contraception services. Um, you ask why, I think that's a question to put to our legislature. Um, I do not know the answer to that. Um, I can make some guesses, but um, in the end, these um, laws are written by uh, the, the folks that we've elected. So it's we can certainly ask them. <laughs> yes. I think that is, thank you so much, Rebecca. That was amazing. Um, we still have lots of questions that so we'll collect the one that you were unable to answer and we'll get that out. Um, and again, thank you to the audience. Um, after this, this concludes our webinar. So you'll get an evaluation survey that will comes up in the end. So please fill that out to give us your feedback. And then in about three or four weeks, we will give you the link to a follow-up email with the CME certificate, the recording, the slides, and all the information that Rebecca shared today, along with the Q&A. So I think with that, I want to thank Rebecca again. This has been amazing. We had so many speakers, so many um, questions coming in that we're so excited for. And then so I hope we all enjoy and have a great rest of your week. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nicole. Bye. Bye. Take care.